it's always a challenge to be a speaker after Michael, and uh, this time even more so. A, because he's a very, very good, uh, uh, sp um, no, as, you, as you've seen, he's an excellent um, kind of speaker. Plus, if you have uh, to, to discuss him without knowing what he's going to talk about, it's even more challenging. Although, I have to, to confess that y yesterday afternoon he did offer to discuss his uh, presentation, and we started, but then it was cocktail time, dinner time. And so I have a new theory of it. So it's not true that you know, Italy is not growing because we are very bad in our productivity, etc. It's that the opportunity cost of working in, in Italy is much higher. So that's why the country is the way it is. It's very pleasant. So uh, the, what, what, it should be about what we've really learned. I said, no, 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 no. Before I do that, what have we actually learned in theory? So this is what we know from the theory that um, Mike um, very nicely uh, summarized, so that Roche, Tirol, and Mike himself and others. So this um, two-sidedness has some implication for market definition. And uh, we learned something that Mike is right. We already knew, but um, it's important to remind ourselves that business models are not markets. Uh, sometimes when you see that uh, different companies are offering, say, zero price, as you hear, some, sometimes some lawyers saying, well, if there is a zero price, there is no market, which is obviously, obviously wrong. I mean, this would be, you would say, a bad lawyer, but you do hear this kind of argument. And also the fact that different companies decide actually to offer, to offer a zero price on some size of the, of the market. It's a business model, a dec decision that should not affect the definition of the, of the market as such. Uh, this has challenging implications for, um, for regulators. It is often ignored by competition authorities, not because competition authorities are bad, but because, not being a lawyer myself, I'm very sympathetic that there is a process there. If you start from you know, a wide market definition, and uh, it's, it would be very difficult to start, even to start a case against uh, some other companies. So if instead you start with a narrow market definition, then one side of market definition, you do see that is potentially a problem, and the, then you can go ahead with the implication, with the analysis, and eventually accounting for the two-sidedness when it is up to possible remedies, etc. So the process is, is, is actually inclined to start from a narrow market definition. Otherwise, I would say competition authorities would not have the right uh, tools to intervene but, uh, for the discussion whether this is a good or a bad thing. Uh, some people may actually argue, if, especially if you are a data-driven person, this doesn't matter at all as long as we have the right elasticities, the right uh, data. Let's look at the data. I mean, let's look if uh, some side of the market is particularly inelastic. What is the implication of that? Is there what is the substitution of um, ac 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 across dif different goods? But. We're not often in the lucky position of having enough data. So yesterday, Hustos Aukup said, for instance, how to apply our procedural stuff like a SNP test. Uh, I don't see an increase in price. There is no price. So these are the challenges. Uh, two um, notes here, uh, up from the theory. Some economists have written, and again, rightly so, that um, the one side that logic may be wrong in two-sided markets. This is pretty much the last slide of the Rochetti Roll presentation 10 years ago in the first edition of the conference. True, okay, so we have to be careful. Uh, there is, however, a non sequitur. So some people then go to the extreme and then say, therefore, never intervene in a two-sided market because it, you cannot apply any, any uh, um, uh, logic which is, uh, um, well, which is un understood well enough. Okay, so these consequences, and there are some economists who are saying that, typically those uh, advocating one of the parties involved in this decided market said don't inter intervene. And I would say, no, 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 this is uh, the, the, the logical leap is, is actually wrong. The other point to note, which is again um, a no brainer if you know a little bit of economics, these are markets with. Uh, Whatever is the definition you, you take into account, there is lots of externalities. If you remember the first Wilfer theorem, uh, Economics 101, it would say, well, um, even competitive markets in the presence of externalities, they're not efficient. So I would say that these multi-sided markets, they are strange beasts, they're more complicated. However, the presumption is that they may deliver outcomes with, which are not efficient. So it may make sense to scrutinize them more rather than less because of this inherent inefficiency associated with externalities. Different point is whether this is the right uh, objective of a competition authority. The answer is probably not. The, 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 right, the right objective is instead I come more from, from regulation, so where, where you look at uh, you know, systematic inefficiencies uh, which are uh, entrenched in a particular industry, and then the answer is probably yes. So, so pro probably regulation standards and competition authority standards differ in that respect. 
The other point I want to mention, instead of what, what have we learned, I don't know what you, what you guys learned, but what have, what, 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 what have I learned? Uh, I'm doing a little a bit of work on, on, uh, on uh, this over the past 10 years. Well, one thing is um, this feedback effect. So uh, I know um, something about uh, telecommunications, and I did some work, on, um, for instance, um, in, the, in this sense, the U.S. is really an odd case. Uh, but apart from the U.S., everywhere in the world, we are under a system which is called the calling party pays. So uh, you, you, don't, you don't pay for receiving calls. You, you pay for making calls. And when you make a call, then your call is from network A to network B. And network B, say I'm calling from Telecom Italia landline, I'm calling to a, a Vodafone mobile phone, Vodafone would charge a wholesale fee called termination fee to tele Telecom Italia. So they, the, the price I pay from a landline, actually a good chunk of it is not going to, 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 to uh, Telecom Italia, but it is a wholesale price that the Telecom Italia pays to Vodafone. It's called the mobile termination rate. It's exactly one of those cases with one side of the market is single homing. You have only one cell phone, and instead the other sides of the market, the co those which are calling people are, are, are multi-homing because you, you, you have a phone to contact lo lots of people. So if, if I have to call Janka, I have to call Janka, that's it. And instead Janka would have chosen his uh, particular contract, and I have no, 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 no way of affecting the, the choice of Giancarlo in any possible way. So typically, if you leave this market unregulated, the owner of Janka, the mobile company, will set extraordinarily high prices because this is the, the side that single homes will benefit and will give junk a, ve a very good deal, okay, a very good deal. So if you intervene, at least theoretically, in, in a market like, like that, you say, well, I'm paying too much to call Janka, that's inefficient, so let's try to bring it down by regulation, you would expect the seesaw or waterbed because Janka now bring, brings in less attractive uh, economic proposition, there is less uh, revenues from incoming calls, and the, the, for the subsidy that Janka would get has to decrease. So there is a rebalancing. That, a theoretical proposition, the nice thing about uh, Europe and, and other countries is that countries regulated these mobile termination rates differentially over time. This is really the nice exogenous variation that you really want to have. And to a large extent, you, uh, these, uh, these interventions are uh, exogenous to, uh, to other stuff in the market. So this is the, 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 an evidence, just uh, no, no econometrics, just a picture. And this picture is, is saying, Compare a country that reforms, introduce a policy of reform at time t. The policy of reform here is cutting termination rates. Okay? And uh, so before t, this country is not regulated. Actually, this operator country is not regulated, and then regulation starts. And then compare this, this country, or an operator which received a regulatory treatment, with the control group of those countries which are not regulated ever. Okay, and, and this is saying that prior to this point in time, actually the prices in this, this is the prices that Gian, Giancarlo pays, you take away all the fixed effects, are pretty common uh, to both countries. If anything, the reforming country is actually cheaper because they're more competitive in general, whatever, they are, they are ch they're cheaper on, on average compared to the control group. And then all of a sudden, as they start reforming, i.e. cutting prices, which has a benefit, then the price of Janka goes up. Okay? So this is quite strong evidence of the CISO, or as we call it in, in, in the UK and other countries, the, the waterbed effect. Actually, the name waterbed effect started but because of the first investigation in this case was in 1997 under the Monopolies and Monop uh, Mergers Commission in the UK, which has changed names several times. And, um, um, Paul uh, Jarosky was actually the, the chairman of the commission, and he's, he's the guy who said uh, the waterbed effect it must be at play in this industry. So the implication of this is not, as actually we had to write a rejoinder, because once we sh we've shown that companies such as Vodafone, which are big, giant uh, telecommunication companies, they said, then don't regulate us whatsoever, because you see, if you regulate us, Giancarlo will have to pay a more expensive prices. So we had to write recently a rejoinder explaining, well, no, 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 that was not the, the purpose of our work. It's just to point to this. And actually what's going to be crucial is to uh, examine the elasticity. So maybe Giancarlo is very inelastic. He's going to keep his phone anyway. So there is no loss. It's just a transfer of, of, uh, of surplus. And what matters is to see whether this rebalancing of the prices will induce higher volumes of calls, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what regulators have to look at, the elasticities on the two sides of the market. The other thing I want to touch upon, and again, I know that many of you are from the US and nobody wants to talk about it, and this is the, the net neutrality debate. Okay? The net neutrality debate, what is it? It's about the way the internet service provider, so I say the Comcast, Verizon, or the Telecom Italia, the British Telecom, can have a particular deals with the content provider. So with the Google, with, uh, with say, for, the, for delivery of YouTube videos, for, with the Netflix, etc. 
So there are some facts that you know, there's lots of uh, uh, congestion at some point in time. And uh, there is also different sensitivity, sensitivity of different services of uh, people using the internet. So some stuff, I don't know, online video games I'm not playing and my kids are too small to, to, to do this stuff yet. But apparently these are very sensitive to, to uh, conge 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 congestion. Instead, other stuff like if you are, um, I don't know, doing some uploading stuff in the middle of the night, so this is not going to cause any, any congestion. So, and there, and there are economic issues. Uh, very hotly debated. Perhaps the debate has been really um, too hot in that sense, so we didn't have enough focus on economic issues. Um, especially, is what are the contracts that the ISPs can write with the content providers? Can they charge? Every time you download a YouTube video, should uh, YouTube pay a fee to Verizon? Say, uh, can you offer different quality? Can you have can you have like a slow lane and, and a fast lane? Can you charge for this differential product if you are the ISP? No, this is complicated. Nobody, whatever is your definition for, of uh, a two-sided uh, platform, this is it, right? Because this, this, it, it has all sort of agents, all sort of externalities. So it's one of those cases that what I would say, once you see it, you know it, it, it is a, 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 a two-sided. So this is pornography. Everybody would agree that this is pornography. So this is a, a two-sided market. That is the, the analogy. What's curious is that all the debate in this complex market has been about this stuff, okay? This particular price, the termination fee that the content provider Providers are paying to the ISP. Okay, this is more thing. So, so users sometimes are paying uh, Netflix. Sometimes they 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 they, they don't pay that directly, but only indirectly via the advertising price, etc., or via the data information they are giving to the to the content providers. So, this is a very complicated picture, and we are discussing about this. Okay, about this. And by the way, the current thinking. And the FCC thinking at the, at the present, although of course it's been challenging in the courts as usual, it's that all this stuff. So. Zero termination fees, this price has to be zero. No differential treatment between different types of uh, uh, con content. You cannot offer different quality of a service. The answer is no, 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 no. Okay? This is the, the current situation in the US. So um, what is the economic thinking? Well, part of the, of the public, and I will comment on that. So in the US, it seems to me that people hate the cable companies, and rightly so, okay? And so if, if, you, if you say, well, should the cable company charge Google or charge Netflix for delivery of content, say, why? I mean, they're already making a hell of a lot of money from my sub, sub, uh, subscription fee every month. Why should they allow to charge even more? So, uh, but this is actually wrong if you think it's using two-sided markets, or at least my way of thinking about two-sided markets. And I would say, maybe I'm obsessed with the waterbed effect, the first order effect, if indeed there is some competition, and I will re return to this issue, if there is some competition among ISPs, if they can charge, say, the content providers for a, a delivery, they will not be able to, ch to, to charge me, the end user, the same amount. I would expect a rebalancing. In particular, if they can charge the other side more, my monthly sub sub subscription fee will go, will go down. So, so, so surprisingly, I act, actually, end user, which are so adamantly against the cable companies, would benefit actually from a change of the status quo, other things equal. But I said, if there is competition among ISPs, it's a big if I will, I will uh, return to. So, and. Uh, should they offer different stuff, the slow lane, the fast lane, etc. And then says, now we're using this very blunt instrument for bidding all this type of contracts, which I think is, is very bad. It's very bad because we're missing a price. And, and the prices signal information, which is valuable. They signal information about usage. Maybe I'm uploading or downloading stuff in the middle of the night, and, uh, this is stuff, and uh, it signals stuff about cost as well, so maybe there is no congestion at the moment, or there is a lot, and now we cannot know. Like, peak load pricing is one of these things that we had for many years in regulatory economics, it seemed to be, have, and we, th we thought it was very, um, um, you know, good for efficiency, and now we have abandoned that completely, which is a bit curious to me. Uh, the problem there, is that if there are market power concerns, and my view is that in the US you have a, a bigger problem than in, in the euro for, for historical reasons, you, you have a lot of uh, um, market power among the local ISPs, okay? So the Comcast, the Verizon. So, but then you should address that more directly. It's not via regulating some other stuff that you try interfering with this price mechanism that you're going to make the situation much uh, better. It's either competition law or, so for instance, the, well, there was a merger which was uh, um, 
um, announced but then uh, fell apart because of uh, maybe it would not have gone very far, which is a good thing. Again, that's my personal opinion. But if it's, if it's not enough, uh, if you have this entrenched local monopoly, you should look at uh, st a more st a st a structural uh, remedies. And in this sense, this is again informed by some research I've done, the US tried with a little bit of this unbundling stuff about uh, until 2003, and then you stop also because of political reasons. Uh, the, you know, there was a, the Bush administration after the Clinton ad administration, so everything fell apart back then. It's been more than 12 years that you have really closed systems. Uh, here I've done some, some uh, recent study using microdata from the UK. And, uh, the UK instead has a different regulation uh, and also European regulations are saying you should unbundle if you're Verizon, you have local exchanges or central offices would, would, would be the name in the US and you must allow new entrants to collocate their investments there and that's because we believe this is going to be good for competition and a bunch of other stuff. And what we find is, 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 is quite interesting. I just, just, so the biggest impact that it was um, advocated at least by regulators was well, if you have more competition in the, in the local area, prices will go down. And the answer is no. Again, no econometrics, just a diagram here. If you look at areas where there is local exchanges which have been unbundled, and these are the blue ones, and local exchanges which have not been unbundled, yes, historically penetration goes up. If you the internet increases, but by the end of the, or the, or the, or the period, pretty much everybody has the same access to, to internet lines in countries with and without unbundled local loops. So it did not work along this dimension. But then these are the interesting stuff. As lots of entrants actually did use the opportunity to unbundle the local loops, as you, as you would expect, especially in rich, densely populated urban areas that where they put their own investments. And then what happened is that the new entrants, the blue lines again, they increased speed by a lot. So to understand what happened, you have imagined um, the bottom of the market, which uh, determines who's going to be the marginal buyer, is always supplied by BT, the local incumbent. Instead, the new entrants entered at the top. Or if there is also a cable, com uh, cable uh, pr pr provider, which is actually typically supplying really high speed, they enter at the middle. Okay? But that's, it, that's the idea. They, they, they relax com com competition via product differentiation, and it's a good thing because there is more product variety in the market, but because the bottom is not supplied by the, end, by the entrance and there is not, uh, not a lot of price activity going on there, that's why you don't have effects on the penetration on the market shares at the local level, which is more or less the same at the end of those who have. But there is a positive impact via this quality adjusted uh, uh, mechanism. So to conclude, that's my last slide. Um, the implications for antitrust competition policy and regulation of two-sided markets that almost ine inevitably this uh, will lead to, because there will be always the push of somebody to say you have to look at the holistic bigger picture, so almost inevitably uh, you will have wider re re relevant markets. When, and again, I'm not saying I'm in favor of this, but this implies to me if that is going on, it will be much more difficult to intervene exposed. Okay? Unless you, you have this procedural thing where you almost uh, mechanically narrow market definition at first to then look at the implications l later on. But if we still go through this, uh, I know that Michael said it's just, you know, market analysis is just a tool. Okay? It's, it's, it's not an end in, in itself, but procedures are inevitable in, in, the, in this market. So if you start with a, market, a wider market definition, it's very difficult. You, 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 you will come up with strong cases uh, even at the very beginning. So I do see precisely because of the externalities. This is a market with externalities, and that's a bit different from the one-sided market. So, and uh, there are some endemic ma market failures. There are bottlenecks, which are really entrenched. And when you have a, a bottleneck problem, you should reconsider more structural ap 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 approaches. And again, this is, more, um, this is where I'm more influenced by the stuff I know in, uh, in uh, telecommunications. Unbundling should not be just, uh, an, it's not, even in the US, you should not think that th this should not come again. Unbundling has been quite relevant in Europe. Thank you. <laughs>